Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together from time to time and talk about the various topics that tend to occur to one, uh, to trouble one, to trip up one when one embarks on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and a teaching artist, and the other host is... Uh, hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger, and I do uh, creative process coaching, UX design, and make video games too. You do you you are what they call a polymath, right? I, yeah, I don't know. Does one call oneself a polymath in polite company? <laughs> Rude. <laughs> Look at this guy. He calls himself a polymath. <laughs> Figure it out, polymath. What's, what you got? <laughs> Another discipline in there? My Come water on. heater's acting up. You got a lot of disciplines. Get down there. Fix it. Uh. Um. <laughs> Come on, let's not let's have that, that kind of hostility toward. Uh, well, toward. I, yeah, but I do wrestle with that because yeah, I mean it's uh, I identify with that kind of thing. So we've we've talked about that a, a good number of times on the show. I mean, one of our early episodes, I think, was like a you know jack of all trades or person of all trades or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, we acknowledge that there's a bit of uh, so in in a creative endeavor you end up at least needing to do a variety of perspective taking for your audience and then your potential, potentially your collaborators, your clients, all that stuff. But then uh, it can go deeper as far as like, you may have a bunch of extra work or stuff related to the perspective taking that, you know, has you doing things that aren't like your self labeled major expertise. And sometimes that's a lot of your time. So what, I don't know. I, I, I tend to, yeah, I roll with that. Um, I don't, I don't mind it, but I also don't wave it around all the time where it's like, you know, like, so I suppose I, I call the, yeah, ah, I got the Polytechnic cast. I got whatever. I, I do sort of own that label. Maybe I should own it more, honestly. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as, maybe this could we could like front end this for a potential final thought. So, like the, the format of the show, if you haven't tuned in before, is actually it's just us two guys, and we talk about you know making art. Um, and the front end of the show is usually us talking about what it looks like when we do it, and then the second half of the show is how we think about what we when we're doing the thing, uh, and then we close with a final thought, some kind of like what we used to call a curveball, a little question that we can kind of wrestle with. And you know, one of the things we've been trying to wrestle with lately is finding more specificity and defining what our jobs are. So when we describe ourselves to other people, we can say, you know, when I say cartoonist and teaching artist, that says something. But, you know, teaching artist isn't super specific. It doesn't say who I teach, right? Um, doesn't say in what, what venues I teach. So I wonder if we could put for the, the back end of the show, in, the, in case anybody's watching live and wants to interact with us, um, what, what specific, uh, how would you define Rob's job, right? Oh, my. All the various things he does. How would you define what he does and who he does it for? Me too, if you want, right? But then, yes. Thank you. We, yeah, take some of the heat off, please. <laughs> uh, we could we could uh, put that as an open call in the show, uh, but then also like it, potentially for a, a second half back end uh, final thought kind of thing. But uh, speaking of doing lots of things, taking on various you know lots and lots of responsibilities and putting on various hats and whatever metaphor you want to use for doing this visual storytelling uh, endeavor. We do like to remind ourselves every once in a while to back off, take a break, and you are not your work, and you need to nourish your creativity and charge your batteries and whatever metaphor you want to use for that. And that's when we do an episode called Reading, Watching, Playing, where we talk about things that we're reading, things we're watching, things we're playing, things that are helping us lately. And then in the second half of the show this week, we're going to talk, uh, respond to some leaner comments. Sound good to you, Rob? I love it. Let's uh, Let's be... Let's be gentle with ourselves <laughs> and take breaks sometimes. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I'll play some music that you know you're not going to hear, but it signals to the people who are listening to the podcast that things are changing. We're changing gears. Intro's over. Now we're in the show. <laughs> Ever since we started this new format and streaming here, uh, you narrate the transition to help me know there's a transition going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 
uh, 80% more transition for your value. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we re reading, watching, and playing? Who wants to go first? Oh, gosh. How about you go first this time, Jersey? Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay, I'll pull up. What so, um, reading, I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks um, ever since I moved to Columbus, Ohio, and started to interact with their library system, which is utterly fabulous. Like, you can get a library card for any library in the state. It doesn't have to be like, oh, well, I live in Worthington, so I can't have a Columbus Metropolitan Library account. No, you can. As long as you live in Ohio, you can have a card at any library you can borrow from any library so it's like that is an enormous impressive network of libraries to work with and then also uh they a lot of them use um overdrive hoopla um are you familiar with these services uh would that be like digital borrowing mechanism yes, digital digital borrowing for you can borrow comics you can borrow books you can borrow movies you can borrow audiobooks cds um and so i have been um consuming a lot of the great courses series so can you list uh, those again because i've heard of libby but libby. you mentioned other other things that i'm not familiar with uh overdrive to use different ones different apps uh as far as i understand libby and uh overdrive are pretty much the same uh i think they're actually libby is an overdrive app it's just a newer version overdrive mm -hmm. is like a slightly clumsy version hoopla is a different borrowing service altogether um and so i've just found that um on my i have like an ancient android um galaxy note 4 that i just use as like sort of like an ipod touch kind of deal um and it just has an enormous amount of storage because hey guess what back then you could change the batteries and you could upgrade the storage it's so novel i could customize this thing to do what i want um so i dropped a big uh sd card in it so i can just download all this stuff that i borrow and then i can just have it on the go rather than like use my data service on my iphone that doesn't let me upgrade anything um so uh, Hoopla just seems to work better with my old Android phone. It just doesn't crash as much. Libby crashes a lot on it for some reason. So uh, that's not a, a, but Anne uses Libby all the time. So it's probably just my phone. Um, but uh, yeah, different different libraries use different services. So, but like be, being in Ohio where I have so many libraries to choose from, it's like I could use both. I could use Libby using Overdrive or I can use Hoopla. It doesn't make a difference. Um, so uh, yeah, I as I was saying, I was I've been consuming a lot of the Great Courses series. Which if anybody here listens to our show, probably listens to the You Are Not So Smart podcast. It always gets promoted on there. Um, but you can, if you have a library service with Hoopla, you can download these. You know, not not for free. Your tax dollars pay for the library service, but uh, you know, th there's a uh, it's 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 relatively cheaper than signing up for a Great Courses account. And the one I've been consuming recently is called Why Evil Exists by Charles T. Matthews. And it is a it's a 36 part lecture series on how different philosophers have defined and described evil going back all the way to like uh, Celtic times, all the way to now, uh, ancient Celtic times to now. So like I'm I just got through like Greek mythology, Roman mythology. Oh, no, actually it went all the way back. Now that I think about it, it went back to ancient Sumer. That's where it starts. So you're talking about Epic of Gilgamesh and like what what are those stories, how do they define what evil is and what our relationship is with it? Now I'm up to um, the Enlightenment and you know the philosophers around the times of the uh, American Revolution, John Locke and that kind of thing. Um, fascinating series uh, and it's it's even though it's called why evils exist, it's more or less just talking about how our humanities and philosophy's relationship with the definition of what evil is and what our duty is to it, but whether to, you know, destroy it, repel it, or or even instances where they talk about like necessary evils, right? Where like an evil that causes a good. Like what how do we feel about that? So it's it's heavy stuff. Um I have noticed that like I was listening to it in the car when I was going to pick up Anne from work and um student load-in is happening right now all the students are coming back to osu and so there's a lot of like traffic jams with a lot of parents looking for places to put their kids and i noticed that when i'm navigating difficult traffic i can't listen to it because it's too engaging right so it's like okay this is perfect for inking and for doing penciling i could not thumbnail to it and i can't drive in difficult traffic w with it on because it's 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 so intellectually engaging so 
um, Why Evil Exists by Charles Matthews in the Great That's Courses impressive. Series. And you said it was uh, 30 some lectures? 36 one, uh, half hour lectures. So, Ooh. yeah, it's, <laughs> wow. it's, it's, it, it'll, it's, a, it's an investment, uh, or you could look at it as it will uh, fill a lot of work hours or driving hours. Uh, but I, I find it absolutely compelling. Um, so, talking about Nietzsche, talking about uh, Dostoevsky and uh, Aristotle, Plato, uh, I think some of the other thinkers that they mentioned in there. Um, but yeah, yeah, so. Wow. Um, so what you got? Let's see. Well, you know, kind of similar. Uh, uh, working, I, I tend to listen to audiobooks. Uh, I do read physical books still, and I read um, uh, e-books as well. I, it just, it depends uh, as far as, you know, some, a lot of times I, I try to do some parallel going back and forth, especially if there's diagrams and visuals or, or um, like cheat sheets or what have you resources. Right. Um, but sometimes audiobooks come with like a down, a PDF download, which mm. kind of can cover that space and be good enough. Right. Anyway, um, I'm, uh, I, I just finished on the commute to uh, drop off the kiddos this morning with them, the story, the wild robot. Mm. Mm hmm. And it's, you know, it's kind of like why evil exists. <laughs> Not at all. And, <laughs> but kind of actually, right? So the, the premise of the story is a, um, you have this, this wild island, this, uh, you know, untouched place on the planet, and a robot washes ashore. And mm. then begins to exist in that environment and then how 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 does that how how does the environment affect the robot how does the robot affect the environment and all that and some really fascinating things as far as um like great conversations i mean honestly i think it was a great book um i think it's it's targeted toward young readers right but i think it's a it's a pretty powerful great well-told story that um, I think it's an all, an all ages thing. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and let's see, what else? So, I mean, serious themes as far as, you know, the, the raw, um, the ideas of, of ecosystem and nature and, you know, how does it function and animals eating animals and uh, animals helping animals and all this kind of stuff just great topics to to you know it's an awesome story to listen to with your kids on also which is uh you know it's led to some fun conversations um and and honestly it's masterful it reminds me of how uh we talked about uh the like some a conversation that's come up multiple times of, of like artists after uh a2 calf a couple of years ago on the grass in, in near the um, the music festival, just on, just decompressing and chatting, and how uh, Keen Su brought up his method for uh, writing uh, March Grand Prix, which is about cute animals and race cars. But he initially uh, was thinking of, of like sort of his own, uh, you know, for you know, I, I don't want to say like not how do you like a story for older audiences version of. Um, uh, uh, fast and furious, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, totally mapping and making appropriate for another, for another audience. And, uh, which is a great exercise to see like, well, where, where are these ideas strongest or what have you? But like, it's, it reminds me of that where it's, it finds, it finds an approachable way to deal with some, some heavy topics and it's, it's a good ride. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. I, for, I keep forgetting about that conversation with Keen. Um, and it's something I need to think about when I'm drafting my future projects is just, just make the story that I want to make and then see if there's a way to adjust the language and the approach for whatever audience that I wanted to reach. Um, yep. And that's, I'm, I'm a hundred percent on board with that. Now I've encountered this in a few different areas. Um, like I've seen talks that, um, I can't remember the event, but it was one of those things of, uh, oh, yeah, I can't, it was, it was a, a local, um, a local meetup and someone gave a talk about, um, 
like how how it can be functional to like reuse metaphor in legends and all this kind of stuff to describe other things and and like just to get moving and and so like if you use your own story in any raw um in any shape or form get it out of you and then now you can you can do other things with it including looking at it and saying you know I, that was a kid's story but i could add you know other stuff to it and i think it's i think it holds up and it's even better right or the other way um or the, like we talked about this recently too we just jump into a different audience saying mm-hmm. like now it's bmx <laughs> <laughs> right um, right yeah, yeah. I, I that yeah that's a, that's a really good thought experiment and it's a good way to shake us out of our our preconceptions about like serving different audiences right um and 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 assumptions that we may have about whether or not we have anything to serve that audience um so absolutely so yeah all right so uh wild robot what about um what about you jersey what's uh, what else you've been reading watching or playing uh playing playing sadly not very much lately um been doing uh a bit of like teaching travel this summer um and well i mean i guess watching watching slash play does this count as play no it doesn't count as playing because i'm not actually engaged with the thing um i did break out the game boy like the game boy um oh, i keep forgetting what it's called it's the one that opens like a laptop the little silver one. Oh, the uh the ds or the 3ds DS, not the 3DS. Uh, okay. So is the one that's backlit and it's like about like you know the size of oh, half wait, a deck of cards. Uh, the SP. SP. Thank you. Yes, yes that is what it's called. Where, where it's more like a it's a it's a blockish clamshell, not the yeah. rectangular. Yeah. It literally looks like a little baby MacBook, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, so I, I broke that out not long ago, and like was because it, it, the games for it that I have are all very casual games. I could just bip in and bip out of. So I was playing like a little bit of Yoshi's Island on it, right? Um, oh, Rob's getting it. He's actually got it. He's got it in the studio. Of course he does. <laughs> there we go. There go. That's it. That's a visual. Which I guess that's like kind of like a retro game now, right? Because I think th- what I was playing that back in like two thousand four. You know, when yeah. I was playing like Metroid Fusion for the first time and Zero Mission for the first time. Um, so, but uh, but yeah, I was doing like a little bit of Yoshi's Island on it recently, but like just five minutes here, five minutes there, nothing where I'm actually getting involved. Do you still boot up? Oh, yeah, totally does. Um, but I don't have a game in it right now. So, um, um, I just was looking at, I added a skin to it and this is back when, uh, anyway, there's a skin. Yeah. Oh, it's not, you know. Oh gosh. This is back when I would read back when I would read Penny Arcade. So anyway. Actually, so, uh Ithemus in the chat says Yoshi's crafted world is great if you get the chance. I've not heard of this. See, like I'm I'm still relatively um you know, slow on the uptake with with video games. I, I, I have a, let me just say, I have a very narrow range of interest with video games, so I don't experiment or go out exploring a whole lot. So, any recommendations people have? If I, I really enjoy the cute platformer games, so any recommendations you have there, I'm I'm in. It's, uh, if you, if it works for, let's see, what's the newest system that Ann and I have? We have the 3ds, um, and then we got a Wii. We don't have anything after that. I, I'm waiting to get a Switch. As I've said many times in the show, once Metroid Prime 4 comes out, then yes, I will be the first in line to buy my Switch, and hopefully I will be able to get it at that point because they've been out for a while. Um, so not not playing a whole lot of stuff right now, but um, in the, we also have a fourth sort of bonus category called Helpful. Um, and so something I've found helpful is that we are at the beginning of a new school year, as I was talking about earlier, and that means there are big sales at most uh, North American stores on school supplies. And so every year this time, Ann and I go to a couple different stores and try to check out what we can get. And we found um, the the graph composition book is, you know, what I use for my emergent task planner. Emergent task planner being um, the, the planning device created by David Say of davidsay.com, where you map out what your day is proposed to look like, but you're leaving room for emergent tasks to bubble up and appear on there. And at the beginning of every week, I chart out what 
you know, I'm going to do for the week by color category. So red category is teaching events. Green category is freelance comics work. Purple category is personal work. Blue category is podcasting with Rob. Pink category is personal stuff. And then like this dark blue is like my uh, advocacy work with like Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival and CXC. Um, so I map out my week on it and then I like each page becomes a day of the week where I chart out what the day, what I'm proposing to do that day. Um, you know, like the, there's the hours of the day and there's the tasks that I'm going to do. And then I have a special section at the bottom where it's like, what good happened today? Like try to capture like one qualitative aspect of the day. We've talked about this a bunch of times in the show, but these things, if you get them on Amazon, they're like Two, between two and four dollars you get them this time of year at um you know a big box store like walmart meyer target you can get them for like 50 cents a piece so and one of these will do six months of the year for me so um i go through about two of these grid graph composition books a year for my etp and then i got 20 of them <laughs> last week so it's like okay we're, we're set for a while right um but then also, you know, it's like I stock up on index cards. You can get index cards for like 25 cents a pack this time of year. And if you use crayons as much as I do in my teaching work and just for like fun drawing, you can get crayons, a box of 20, 24 Crayola crayons for 25 cents. So um, this is a good reminder to get out there if you don't have um, some, you know, drawing slash uh, capturing notes supplies. This is the time of year to get them. Good reminder. And uh, yeah, that's so handy. Uh, one thing to mention too, uh, you know, another shout out to Dave Say is that, uh, I mean, he has the Emergent Task Planner in like digital form, his thoughts that went into it. He blogs so much about his process and how he plans and reflects and whatnot. And I mean, so of course, uh, it, it's kind of natural that someone like Dave would come up with these tools. And uh, he also sells physical emergent task planner sheets in a variety of forms. And they're really good quality. I've bought them before. Uh, I find them handy to, um, to, bring, to bring into my process from time to time just to, to shake things up. So it's not necessarily, um, I do kind of my, my own sort of thing with, um, to mention something helpful for me. But uh, uh, before I get to that, again, like uh, I, I I'm pretty sure if you search for emergent task planner on Amazon, or if you go to uh, what is it, davidsay.com, you'll you'll be able to to um, you know get convenient links to purchase physical versions of that if you want to check it out. Um, so, because sort of like drawing out your own thing day to day, I mean that that can work. I kind of like mm -hmm. that some sometimes even like yeah. again a nice mode. And David say, I will say like to not turn this too much of an ad for him and i just linked to it in the chat in the the live stream on twitch twitch.tv slash lean into art um it he is really thoughtful about what materials he uses so i have purchased his emergent task planners from his amazon store and they are lovely the paper is really excellent quality the printing is really nice it's it's ring bound so you can flip the pages around it makes it really easy to switch to whatever day you're working on it's a really nice size it's he's really thoughtful about how he's mapped out spaces for you to capture information um but then, yeah, once I used those for, I, I used his his uh, templates for, I want to say, like five or six years. And then finally, I I learned some customization that works especially well for me. And that's where I started using the hand-drawn one. And for me, Sunday afternoons is my self-meeting day where I sit down and I draw out my pages for the rest of the week. So, like, I'll go through and well, I'm trying to find a blank page. Yeah, where I'll go through and I'll draw out, you know, the hours of the day. I'll make all my spaces for everything with my ruler. And it's it's a quiet contemplative thing to do to like sort of like get myself thinking about, okay, well, what's up ahead for the next week? What didn't I get done this week? And it's a way to check in on the previous week as well as look at what is ahead for the week. Um, it's a nice sort of um, reset button is hand drawing my ETP. Uh, and I think we talked about that with Dave on the show. He's been on the show a couple times now. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah, definitely. Uh, I thought it's just going that, that little extra. Let's, let's make sure we um, also point to that as a product too, because, uh, because it's there. And, you know, sometimes uh, working off of an existing, um, you know, guide, so you're not sort of stuck with your own blank page and before you're really uh, fluent and, and comfortable with it. That absolutely. Be helpful. Um, absolutely. So 
uh, this is kind of, let's see. So this, this is a couple of things. Um, I have been a user of these uh, circle notebooks for, um, for what, at least eight years or so. And uh, one of the uses I've had for them is, is actually, I mean, uh, the, uh, let's see. So Dave say now sells emergent task planners uh, pages that fit within this, but mm. there was a time before that. And anyway, so I would print my own and, and, um, and then use the little, Oh, the um, it's like a paper punch that gets any kind of paper ready for this, this book. And you can easily just sort of, you know, pop it in and out where, uh, um, you know, these little circles, like every bit of it, this is customizable. So it's like you've got the, you got the outer, you know, the outer, um, cover, you can have inner dividers and all that stuff for, you know, making, making sections and all that stuff. So it's kind of like a new trapper keeper sort of. Um, yeah. 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 It's, it's trapper keeper for uh, polymath, um, self-motivated, productive people. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yes. Um, when I, you know, when I'm thinking my polymath thoughts, I, I need, which are different than your thoughts. Just so you know, I'm underlining that (laughs) you can aspire to the mathiness and the polyness of the, of the polymath, but then there must be the, the appropriate tools to, uh, Oh my gosh, we're not doing tool port on this show, but, uh, but that is the, (laughs) Or 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 a guru snobbery, right? I mean, yeah, just, no uh, no guru snobbery, no tool porn. We both we okay. If there's anything Rob and I sneer at, it's those two things. Um, but like Lit Lab makes a series of of notebooks like that that I think is is really a neat idea. Yeah, you're right. It's like it's like a kind of a, a customizable trapper keeper slash day planner thing. That's a neat idea. And I didn't realize that Dave made uh, pages you could download that um, fit that size. That's great. Yeah. So now there's, yeah, he's got the electronic template, uh, in, in a couple, I mean, he's got many permutations of it, right? So you can find the mm. one that works for you and, you know, print it out to the right size. Um, I'm using my own sort of planning pages. I have for the last few weeks been skipping doing the hour planning and just doing, uh, this, this process of, um, like looking forward and looking back. And this is something that, that my wife and I, Kate have been designing. It's, you know, related to, some workshop stuff that we're working on and all that for our coaching business. And, um, it's, uh, it's this combination of like, uh, you know, looking ahead and in, in like what, uh, write how you want your life to look like in five years as though you already made it happen. So there's a bit of that feel like future vision stuff, your next big goal, next step on that goal. Um, what am I going to connect with and support today? But there's also looking back what went well, didn't go well, and also gratitude and high fives. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so it's this, uh, yeah, it's this, it's this practice that, that I've been, I've been doing some form of it for, for some time and at different cadences. Like I, I used to do that process weekly and then do emergent task planner daily. Mm. Um, but then I've found value in the, in the sort of structured journaling to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm keeping in touch with my, I, my thoughts on what do I want to remember about these particular things I'm, I'm thankful of or for. Anyway, so it's been, um, that's been a fun practice, but I'm putting it in this notebook that, um, let's see, I, 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 I set my link aside here, but um, it's, what's the actual, it's a disc notebook, right? And so I think oh. someone's patent expired and now there's more options in the market. So a few years back, there was only, there wasn't that, I, as far as I could see that many places to buy this and they, they weren't that, uh, they, they weren't as, as, as inexpensive as I would have hoped, but, um, but now they're way more approachable price wise. And yeah. Yeah. Flexible. Yeah. For, fourteen ninety nine on Amazon, the Talia disc bound discs and covers three pack. You get a three pack. Mm-hmm. So get one for a friend. That's great. Yep. Yep. All right. So, oh yeah, a listening. Are you? Is there anything that you're listening to right now besides audiobooks? Um, listening besides audiobooks. Uh, I'm trying to think because I I was I actually put on some music recently, 
And a, a friend I was, I was talking about with a friend, and they, they remarked that like, oh, I, I didn't know you still listen to music. Because <laughs> I, I don't talk about music very often. Um, it, funny enough, uh, one of the things I found just accidentally when I was searching through things I could borrow on Hoopla was the, uh, the soundtrack to John Carpenter's The Fog, which is like not like... Oh, this is fun listening while I'm working today. Uh, but I did put it on while I was uh, just doing housework, like doing laundry and doing like, you know, cleaning the kitchen and, and everything. And I don't know. I just I, I have such a fondness for John Carpenter's movies and for his soundtrack and for how atmospheric they are. It it, it was in its way a pleasant listening experience, um, but it wasn't like bouncy, like let's get stuff done because it's like it's like the fog has a very haunting and eerie soundtrack, right? Yeah, I mean, didn't you just kind of turn your house into a haunted house by doing that? Well, it was a sunny day, right? Like that <laughs> counteracted everything. Uh, but yeah, it, it was. I guess if somebody walked in, it would look kind of incongruous because, like, the, yeah, I was. There was parts where I'm like washing dishes, and you hear the the track where the, the little boy's babysitter gets like captured by like the 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 zombie pirates, and you hear that hiss sound, and there's that dun 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 kind of thing. I was like, okay, <laughs> not. Yeah, it, it's not. I, it's not anything that I would be like, hey, guys, you want to listen to something? <laughs> okay. Let's put this on. Let's jam. You know, it, but it was something where um, I guess it was more like this is a way for me to get in touch with this story that I have a lot of fondness for in, without having to like fully commit to it. Right. Uh, because like the sound, the soundtrack sort of like letting me in and out of the story while I'm attending to these other things. So like if I were to say listening, yeah, that's the the music I was listening to recently. Um, I also. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, my music tastes. Uh, I don't think I, I have like a, a music taste that I could define because like be, be, the other thing I was listening to was um, uh, Spike Jones music. Uh, are you familiar with Spike Jones? Um, he's sort of like the Weird Al of the 30s. Or forties, maybe. Um, no. It like it's like it's like full orchestra, big band music, but it's like very silly and like they have like like burp noises and like he actually uses like a pistol as like a, a acoustic uh, instrument and it, a lot of banjo and silly horns and um, they take like popular songs of the time and just play them in a very silly way. Um, so it's wow, Toto, Toto <laughs> Weird Al. Yeah, like when you listen to it, it's like, okay, you could see how you can get from him to Weird Al. Um, so I was listening to that in the car recently when I was driving around. Uh, just like very like high intensity, silly, goofy, Looney Tunes kind of music. Wow. What about you? Really what are you awesome. listening to? <laughs> um, let's see. So, um, oh gosh. Well, as far as, as, far as music, um, there's there's a band called unleash the archers and I've been uh, really hooked since li listening to their latest album uh, called apex. And they mm. are a sort of, um, Oh, I, I'm not that great at the, So they're a metal subgenre and they're a fast metal subgenre that, that sings, they, they do long epic fast songs with, you know, sweeping emotions and stuff. So, you know, whatever, Whoever, whatever that name is, it's, um, it, uh, and yeah, they're a lot of fun. So I've been listening to more of their back catalog now and because mm. they're in the studio working on something new, so I can't hear that. So I can hear their older stuff. I think I've listened to them before. Um, yeah. Uh, it, what are they release the archers? Is that what they're called? Unleash the archers. Unleash the archers. I, I know I've listened to them before. I'll have to look to see if I can find them on one of the streaming services I use. Um, they're like, you said they're fast metal? Yeah, um, the, especially, uh, yeah, th there's a lot of, um, you know, there's mood and slowness and, and rises and falls in intensity and stuff. It's the, it's the whole, you know, emotional arc that a lot of you know, epic sounding metal likes to do, right? Um, there's you know, the, their, their main singer is very much a, um, the, the, let's see, the crooning operatic, um, type of clean singing, but then they have their, one of the, one of the guitarists is also a backup singer who's got the growl from time to time. And so they're, yeah, they've got, you know, for what they're, for what they do, I think they have a lot of, uh, um, 
just a lot of depth and variety. And uh, I, I find like, so what hooked me on the album Apex was this sort of this haunting feel it had, but also um, joy and intensity of um, just overcoming big obstacles that uh, when I, and, and, and it's like my own assumptions that I inject into the music when it's like, I'm kind of picking up the lyrics and then at some point I see a video, one of the videos on the album of, um, on YouTube. And it's, a, if it's a lyric video and then I'm like, Oh, I heard, I, I heard that wrong. And, you know, <laughs> piecing things together a little bit over time. And it's, uh, let's see. I mean, so it's kind of concept album me and it likes, you know, it's there, it really has a, this, this feel of like when you, when you complete, listening to the album you could easily go back in the cycle and go around again and uh there's a uh right i mean and my understanding of it is probably totally wrong but to me there's there's some kind of uh ancient powerful creature that gets awoken from its slumber and then someone is it's just a pawn in this bigger battle between different sides and eventually it gets to go back to sleep (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's yeah anyway i don't know if i have it right but it's uh wherever i'm at my uh, i enjoy my misunderstanding of the album uh, and i were talking about this not long ago about how like it's fun to think about like the, the misunderstandings you have about lyrics sometimes um and you know that that uh, karate kid 2 the theme song by peter satara um i am in the the glory of love i am a knight who will fight for your honor and all that stuff remember yeah. that song right yeah. Uh, and she was telling me how when, the, when she was a little kid, she would swing on the swings with their friends and they would sing the song for that. And they thought it was, I am a knight who will fight for Yurata. Yurata being this mythical place that they were all imagining, right? Like like that that this not having seen the movie yet, only heard the song. They think it's this this song about some kind of fairy tale, right? Uh, oh, sometimes the that's misunderstandings, awesome. Yeah, sometimes the misunderstanding is better. Um, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, yeah. One more, one more listening. I, I have to wholeheartedly. So like we, we do, we, you know, we talk about art casts, you know, podcasting about your process and reflecting on stuff you make and all that. Uh, there's a super awesome one that, um, that I recently encountered in, in my feed uh, by Jock Nem. And it's, uh, it's so funny. He did such a masterful way of like telling, telling the world that he was doing this podcast, talking about it a little bit from time to time. And it's and um, like some of the premise and why he's doing it, and so I was like, "Gosh, release, get this podcast out already! Come on!" I'm like, I was just waiting for it, right? And and then when he did, he released a season all at once. He dropped like eight episodes that are all awesome reflections, and he has these amazing call to actions at the end of it. Where the only problem I have with it is like, I totally want to reply to this. And then the next ones would start and I would go, I'd start listening and be like, Oh, this is awesome. <laughs> and start listening to his next premise and then his next call that. So I've like, you know, I've, I've a lot of ideas for stuff to share and to respond to his really good uh, sort of art personal reflection art podcast called slow down. Slow down with three O's by Jacques and it's on uh, anchor. Yep. Really good. All right. Well, cool. It, it, and it's a, it, it yeah. says it's a microcast, so it's less than 15 minutes an episode. And so it's just like, so like a little check-in thing. That's neat. Um, and it says it's for creative entrepreneurs. Right? Yep. So it has a micro podcast for creators, uh, cr- creatives, entrepreneurs, folks who make stuff. We'll chat about not stressing ourselves out and learning to enjoy our journeys. Well, that sounds very harmonious with what we do on this show, right? I Except- absolutely. I was. That's why I was. Yeah, I was very much anticipating this thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's it's it's. I think anyone listening to this, anyone watching this, just go check it out. Okay. Well, that's a good enough. Uh, segue to make the transition uh take a break thank some people who make the show possible and then we'll come back and do some leaner comments sound good sounds awesome okay so in one minute 30 seconds we're going to come back and answer some comments from people who interact with the show and uh close out with our final thought possibly and then, uh, but before we do that we got to thank some people who make the show possible those people happen to be the folks who support us on patreon yes patreon.com slash 
lean into art is the website what is it well surely you've heard of it by now patreon is this crowdfunding mechanism where instead of you know funding one big thing you fund ongoing things you make projects sustainable through regular support and you can support this show for as little as a dollar a month and i want to thank five people who have been doing exactly that uh first up dave say we just talked about him dave say you can find him on twitter at Dave say you could tell him how awesome the emergent task planner is and all the things that he makes uh Stephen Stone Bush thank you Stephen for making the show possible and for believing in us and what we do Nate Marcel you can find Nate on Twitter at great sea monster thank you Nate for believing in us and Carrie Goble Billick you can find Carrie on Twitter at motion girl thank you Carrie and finally Owen Jolins longtime supporter of the show been a guest on the show you can find Owen on Twitter at comic colorist two c's in the middle two words comic and colorist and you can join them at patreon.com slash lean into art we will find all the shows we make as well as the extra leans the shows we record only for people who support us on patreon we do them once a month and that's me and rob riffing live on an idea and uh, at the end of the episode it becomes an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place with fellow leaners patreon.com slash lean into art thank you to everybody who supports us there it means a lot to us it really does. What a what a great thing for people to do. All right, I'm gonna hit some music to get us to the second half of the show. And if Rob could hear this, he'd be punching all over town right now. <laughs> but he can't hear it because I haven't figured out how to route my audio properly yet with the new Twitch setup. So, but believe me, Rob, it was it was exciting music. It was one of your favorite tracks. Um, mm. <laughs> So I love music. <laughs> I can't wait to be able to hear it again on our show. And honestly, I'm really great. By the way, Jersey, you've done so much awesome work um, transplanting us from a setup that we used for years and years. And now boop, here we are practically teleported to our new home. And it's, uh, it's, it's been working out great. Uh, and I, I deeply appreciate it. So oh, that that's what bros do. Um, okay. Gentle bros. Mm-hmm. <laughs> going back a few episodes uh okay how about we respond to some comments and questions from the leaners um we got a, a message on patreon from spaceman 360 did you get a chance to read this yet rob uh yeah i did i even didn't i do a reply to you probably did yeah um because it's, it's a bit of an old message i was going back through the archives just to see like what hadn't i personally responded to recently um I was doing the same yeah and cool. even, uh, and I, I remember I saw one from, uh, with Rachel Ross, I think, and was just had that, had a oh, reaction because there was no reply on there, but we actually did a whole show in reply. So, okay. Okay. I, I quickly was like, Oh, shoo. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I left an answer to it to help me future Rob, not have another, um, uh Oh, reaction. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I know you do enough podcasts. You might have forgotten you did this one. Here's a link. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's so th I, this is a way to say like, yes, interact with us and send us comments, messages and emails. And if we don't get back to you right away, it's very likely we're going to turn it into an episode because if we don't have a pithy answer for it, if we don't have a short answer of like, well, just do this, that's all. Um, if it's like a really interesting question to chew on, we'll probably turn it into an episode. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out to us that way. And this is one of those messages where it's, I just felt like, okay, there's like probably like a little bit we can, we can mull over on this one. It's from Spaceman360 on Patreon. Uh, I'll read the whole message. Uh, Hi, guys. I've only recently joined Patreon, but I've been following uh, Lean to Art for a few months now, and I love this podcast. Thank you very much. That is very kind of you. Uh, I have a question, but I want to describe me in two to three sentences for context first. Thank you for also providing the context. I'm 28 years old, and I'm trying to figure out how to get paid to draw, whether it be graphic design, illustrator. But right now, I'm on night shift stacking shelves. I do have a graphic design gig part-time, blessed. My question is, I have 30 minutes time on a lunch break where I can draw when I'm at work. Can anyone recommend drawing exercises to help improve anatomy, composition, color, values, design? Um, important context here, 30 minutes lunch break. Um, and I think we can both relate to this particular period of our lives, Rob, right? Where we were working a day job that was not related to art mm -hmm. and 
very limited time on the clock to actually pursue any kind of um, workouts leveling up, right? Yeah, 100% remember that. Um, I remember when I was a a janitor working third shift and uh, that was what I did. Third shift, I assume people know what that is, but it's it's essentially working from about 10 p.m. to like 6 a.m. And, uh, and then, you know, on breaks. So, you know, and it was fine. It was fine work and, you know, had satisfying aspects to it. But like that I had, a, of course, uh, that's, that's the time in my life where I started my um, game development work. And, uh, and one thing I really enjoyed was the, like some of the work I was able to fully go into like a mind palace <laughs> and, think about what I was making. And even though I wasn't making it yet, think about the problems I was trying to solve and, and the tools I was trying to learn. And uh, because I was studying a bunch of new things, uh, I knew basics of programming, but I was trying to get better at programming. I knew, uh, you know, so anyway, the, the, there, are, there was some advantages as far as like just me believing in and occupying the space that I can do this and I can solve some things. And I think it's one of the reasons why I've, I've started getting so into taking notes because then the, I, the ideas would be there and I would be like, Oh, scribble, scribble, you know, on often on terribly like weird sizes of paper and whatnot. And I would just fold up like a big old placemat and put it in my pocket. And it's like, I'd have a pocket full of weird sizes of paper. Anyway, um, that, uh, Anyway, yeah, I, I remember the, a lot a lot of those those days, and you know sometimes mm-hmm. it would be sketching the character or whatnot too. But um, it was yeah, juggling the especially the game development stuff. How about you? I well, I I think that you and I are cut from similar material in that I don't think it doesn't sound like you had any kind of like formal training regimen you were adhering to. Um, saying like, okay, well, this month is leveling up my anatomy. This month is leveling up my, you know, my writing. This month is leveling up my outlining. Uh, it sounds like you had a project and you were sort of learning all the stuff necessary to feed into that project as you went. Does that sound right? Very much so. Because I, I did a very similar thing. So going back for me, it was, um, I was a blackjack dealer, right? I, I worked in a casino when I was in my early 20s. Because in the town where I lived, in a very rural part of Michigan, there weren't a lot of like high paying jobs for somebody like just dropped out of college and doing comics, you know, for a small publisher. Um, but this like offered a lot of money that I could save up so that Ann and I could move to Arizona so she could go to college and, you know, and so on. Um, and it, at the casino, uh, the way that they did the, the blackjack dealing is you would deal for an hour and then you get a 15 minute break. So you got a 15 minute break every hour. Um, which sounds like an abundance of time until you like figure in all the time walking to the break room, getting yourself a cup of coffee, finding a place to sit down, getting out all your notebooks. Now I got seven minutes, like eight minutes, right? So like very little time to attend anything. So what I did is I used it as an opportunity to sit down and um, I was either sketching or I was writing. Um, I had a sketchbook that I always brought with me to work and I would be working out character ideas, character designs, and I'd be working out um, outlining a book that I wanted to do, a graphic novel I wanted to do that I didn't, I didn't wind up doing. Uh, it was based on a mini comic series I did back in 1995 called The Black Hole Equation, which mm, it, there was some neat stuff in there. But looking back, it's like, oh, there's not a lot I could salvage nowadays. There was, there was a lot of me have it like trying to find something to say without having anything to say uh, in in retrospect but that's another thing altogether but so there was that tension though of like how do i maximize this time so i'm not just uh dawdling right how do i get something to like show for this time that was the tension that was going on there right um and so and then another thing i introduced was uh i think you used this this term a long time ago rob uh urgent capture do you remember this? Mm-hmm. And could you describe what urgent capture is? Because I think that I, I was doing the same thing when I was in my early twenties. Well, it's it's your brain only. You know, it's it's a, it's a wonderful, amazing thing. But but then those like moving those ideas forward in some deliberate, deliberate, consistent, disciplined manner. Um, like I need to capture information, and the and and it comes to mind whenever it comes to mind. So 
Um, actually, I even did this when I was in a, as a teenager at Burger King. That's where I think I started tolerating uh, the the weird sizes of paper. But um, but I but always having something to write with, paper on hand, and and then actually capturing it and not not just sort of letting the thought go away. And, uh, and it's, you know, someone could say like, oh, you know, isn't that a little too clingy and precious? You have a thought, don't worry about it. You'll have the thought again. And to some extent, fair enough, uh, you know, if that works for you. But for me, I enjoy having conversations with past Rob. So mm -hmm. urgent capture helps. Is that kind of where you were going? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And that, and Urgent research too. I would say urgent capture, urgent research. So something I started doing because I noticed that I was in situations where there wasn't like getting into that space to actually get any proper work done wasn't always easy. I also started bringing books to study, right? Um, so this would be books, uh, uh, essays on mythology, folklore, various storytelling traditions um, that I would go to my library and find like anything that sounded remotely interesting, like, um, Thomas Carlyle, yes, 110, 115 years ago, so not everything he says travels well to the 21st century, but there were interesting ideas that he had about, you know, heroism and, and so on. Or, or um, Hogarth Anatomy books. And if, if I don't have that time to actually attend to the lesson, I can at least study. I can sit here for 15 minutes and just read burn Hogarth's dynamic wrinkles and drapery and just and, and visually study it right there's we did an episode with Brandon Dayton of the show uh talking about like drawing from memory right and like part of drawing from memory is just learning to study and like stare and capture and record information in your head and yes there's actual practice of doing it but like there's there, there's something to be said for reading and studying as well um, in a thoughtful way. So I learned to, this is going back to poly, the polymath thing seems to be a theme today, um, but like going to this idea of like having multiple, multiple ways of exploring study and not limiting yourself to one thing. This is, this is my approach. This is what works for me. And I'm going to leave the qualifying at that. But, um, but also Later on, so once we moved to Phoenix, and now I'm in my mid to heading into my late 20s, I'm like 26, 27, um, I was working as a graphic designer at a um, a real estate magazine. So like really, literally making grids of houses, right? This wasn't like, it wasn't demanding a whole lot of my intellectual faculty. But I had an hour lunch every day. <clears throat> And uh, I didn't, and I was working as a freelance uh, illustrator slash designer in my off hours. So I didn't have a lot of bandwidth to do personal projects. So I had this hour every day that I gave myself in my lunch hour. And uh, I picked a project, right? I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do a graphic novel called The Front Rebirth, which I published in 2006, 2007. Uh, it started in 2001 with like, like I just started from scratch. Okay, I'm going to outline until I've got an outline of a 222 page book. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to like sort of break down each chapter, chapter one through six. And I'm going to like in my lunch hours, I'm just like starting to like write out the scenes, like write out like the general idea of what happens. Okay. Once that's all done now in my lunch hours, I'm thumbnailing it. And while I'm thumbnailing it, I'm figuring out like various problems of like anatomy, panel size, gesture, you know, viewing angle and so on. And then you know, and so on until the whole book was thumbnailed in, I want to say 2002. I finished, I finished thumbnailing the book in, so it started in like late 2000 to 2002. I outlined and wrote and thumbnailed the whole 20, 222 page story so that in early 2003, I could attend to drawing one page a week until I finished in 2006. So we're talking about a six year process of making one book, but it was because I was doing it with what little bandwidth I had. Um, and over the course of that time, I had to learn, like, for instance, like when I thumbnailed the certain pose, like I, there was a shot where Dick Courage, the mercenary, is holding Galen over his head as he's looking down a three-quarter or uh, three-point perspective down shot of a crowd exiting a building. He's going to throw Galen down to kill him. Um, and figuring out that pose, like I had a rough idea in the thumbnail, but then that meant I had to like really practice or really learn that anatomy and that perspective work when I got to that page. So it's sort of like... What I did in that process, in retrospect, is I was taking on various learning experiences like, okay, well, how do I lay out the page to get this really cool shot that I want while also allowing for this 
other like landing the, the page on this beat so that it lands in a place that makes you want to turn the page um, how can I get the character to say what I want them to say as only they can say it? How can I figure out the composition of this shot to get the maximum amount of information that I want to get in this shot? I'm figuring out all that stuff, but I'm not really thinking about anatomy at this point. Right now, I'm just focusing on storytelling. Then when I got to drawing the final page, okay, past Jersey laid a pretty big challenge at the feet of present Jersey. Now he's got to figure out how to actually draw this pickup truck in three-point perspective while it's taking a turn and thinking about the shifting of the weight of the truck versus the axle of the truck. Plus, the, that's on a different perspective plane than the houses behind it, right? Um, so it became an ongoing learning experience throughout the making of the whole thing. And the the goal of making the thing is what trickled down the the challenges and the 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 um what am i trying to say the the leveling up that i needed to do right um well, did you do any negotiation with that along the way explain negotiation say that, uh, okay this page is a little past let's see so what i set up I could, I think, accomplish in a different way that lets me get it done sooner, quicker, more clear or something, right? Or did mm -hmm. you take your, those initial um, designs basically and say, I'm going to execute that and only that? There were, there were a, a, a two or three pages that I have a clear memory of doing that negotiation with. Um, but for the most part, I tried to do it as close to what my thumbnails asked for as possible. Now, the reason I go back to this experience is because this was a formative experience for me in that I had never done a project that big or that long. And through that project, I learned a lot of new things that I never knew before, right? Like literally drawing a car, turning a corner really fast and thinking about the shifting of all that weight was something I never had to do and I avoided doing before, right? And I never would have thought to even try to level up on that until I thought, you know, it'd be really cool here if there was like this really intense car chase where the people being chased don't know they're being chased, right? Like there's these bad guys who are chasing them and trying to get them, right? But they, they, they don't even know it, right? And so now that presents me with all these different challenges. So I guess if I were to back up and say like what, like in the meta sense, what I'm talking about here, as a young person, I had a real hard time attending to any lesson if I didn't know how it could help me. Like, if I didn't know why I needed to know this, then it was like, well, why am I bothering with this then? I don't understand what this what this connects to in my life. But if I can point at how this is going to directly benefit me, maybe this is a latent self-interest, maybe this is selfishness, I don't know. But like, suddenly I'm fully engaged and I can really attend to it with absolute ferocity, right? And with by having this personal project that I wanted to do as, as a... As, the goal was to have this artifact that says, you see this, this is what I'm all about, potential um, clients, partners, hosting organizations, this is why you should hire me. Here is the thing, right? And now, and what's funny is now in retrospect, it's not as much of a representation of me because it is quite a long time ago and my work has evolved since then, which is the way it should be. But at that time in my life, it's like if I make this book, this becomes an artifact of what I am capable of accomplishing. Now, let's suppose in the case of our Spaceman um, 360, there's no indication that, that we're talking about comics. It's just mentioning like drawing for, you know, um, for a career. Mm. In that case, then I would say, can you lay out, like, if you wanted to do it by my approach, is like, I would say like, what are some things that I think would be immensely fun to try to draw, right? A scene, an image, a picture. And by setting that goal, you're already like inadvertently creating challenges that you're gonna have to level up on to do it. So right. is, a, is a goal alone enough of a why, right? So I think mm -hmm. back to as a young person, I, I think I, can, I could have, I, I initially would encounter things like I picked up guitar because I thought it would be cool to, um, to make these kinds. It's like every, oh gosh, I get, um, I get into a thing because I'm enticed based on how practitioners who are, are, who are skillful with it, uh, make me feel. And that's happened to me over and over, right? Next thing you know, you wake up a polymath and you're like, what, what am I doing? Um, I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry. No, polymath callback. Um, so there is a, uh, but I know I, that initial picking it up where like, okay, so drawing, um, 
having having some you know like wherever you're at i'm guessing you you have a sense of of, of skill and ability and you want to, you have a desire to, a desire to improve but without knowing why uh that the why is this crystallizing focus of like oh because i need to tell this story oh because um i want to make money at it well then you know uh, then the prompts are who you know what what do people need you to draw right uh what are they asking you to draw or is it the um if it's not an entire story is it the image in your head that you want to be able to execute flawlessly? Mm -hmm. um, but there's got to be the, the uh, I, I think that's like to plant the flag and that way you know, oh, that's where I'm going. I'm going there. I want to go there. I know why I'm going there. That makes sense. And now yeah. I just, I, I need to figure out uh, the steps it takes for me to go from where I'm at to there. Uh, which it, you kind of did in a very robust way with the comic example. And I yeah, you can benefit I would say, by adopting that. The, the comic process has this built in, um, you know, hey, here's where you can go next. Um, yeah. <laughs> get to it, this it, stage. Yeah. And, and in retrospect, I had been working as a freelance cartoonist doing short stories for uh, Antarctic Press for a number of years at that point. So I was experienced in the execution of making a comic story and I knew the process already. So it was now it was just like now we're going to extend this process over like six years instead of just doing it in a, a month. Um, but yes, so you talk about robust, a less robust version would be like what we've experimented with with your unblocking project. And what I've done with Inktober in the past. So like every Inktober, I try to say, okay, what's a new thing I can learn through this exercise of shipping a drawing every day? The challenge of shipping a drawing every day is, is robust enough, right? But how can I do something that's easy for me to draw? Like, let's just pick an easy subject and easy tools. I know how to use these tools and I feel comfortable using these tools. And I know I can draw this particular thing every day. What's one thing I can add that will make me level up on something new? First time around, it was the brush pen. I never used the brush pen before. I was really scared of it. Uh, I had been using a crow quill for years, and I really I understood the tool. I felt really confident with the tool. Felt a lot less confident with a brush. All right, we're doing brush pen. I, I'm gonna, but I'm going to pick drawings that are easy for me to draw, so that the brush pen is the only friction point, right? And then that's gone on over the years to where it's like, okay, now I'm at you know I'm going bowling with my friends. I'm going to try to do an art drop every time I go bowling. Um, what's one thing I know how to use a brush pen now. What's one thing I can level up on? Well, watercolor, you know, I'm still trying to get under the hood of watercolor and understanding hue and value saturation and how to balance an image and how to control all this paint that flies all over the place. I start throwing it down, right? Okay. Well now the pressure's off me because I'm drawing something that's easy to do. Uh, I'm, I'm creating something that's like a throwaway piece of art that I'm just going to hide someplace for somebody to come across and find. It's not high pressure because I'm not trying to create a portfolio piece, but I'm checking in on a regular basis with this paint stuff and learning on, you know, on the job, as it were, how to make this stuff work for me so that I'm feeling more confident with it over time. Um, so for me, there's like, it's like, yeah, what helps me feel motivated is to create a shippable goal. I need to learn watercolor so that I can make these art drops. I need to learn brush pen so I can check in with um, uh, Inktober every day, right? And then through that intensity of the regular interval, you wind up acc accruing some skills pretty darn quickly. Um, it's true. Like, so adding that, it's it's like saying the, um, hey, I don't, maybe I don't even fully know why. I know I desire this. I want mm -hmm. to get closer to this. And there's a mechanism that lets me um, be affected by it and I'll accumulate experience as I continue to get affected by it. Um, honestly, there's, there's plenty of projects that I, that I've, that I've done in that way, or, you know, I said a why just to get moving and then I just kept doing it for whatever reason. And this is, uh, so yeah, just to, just to get, um, have to feel the benefits of practice and that's a, it's not trivial. The thing you pointed out there, Jersey, the, so you, the, the, the structure and benefit of like your, your comics process and replacing it with a simple structure benefit of the full creative cycle is how I like to think of it. Like you can have, like, think of it as, um, oh, this drawing could be better or whatever. And you could file it. You, you, you go through the effort to make a thing come into existence that didn't exist before. And then you never share it. Mm -hmm. Is that fine? But uh, there's something a little more accountable, a little more real to it, in my opinion, 
by the sharing of it because now it's a, it's a it's a it's evident it's scientific and it, it's ev- observational evidence that yeah. this happened at this time and another thing happened so yeah shipping it is is a is a good idea and it's in whatever space you feel safe in in the shipping of it but Right. And you could do it anonymously too. Right. Like, but like the fact, like when, when I was doing the bowling night art drops, like nobody, nobody there really knew who was doing it. Right. Even though I signed the work, it's like, it's a big league and not everybody knows everybody's name. And like, there was a couple people who were like, they would see me do it. Like, Oh, you're the guy. You know, like they, I've seen this thing around here. I never, I never knew who did it. Right. Uh, but you know, for the most part, it was a it was a virtually anonymous activity, and that did take the pressure off. But like for me, so when when you say like, well, should I what should I do to improve anatomy, composition, color, values, and design? I would say, well, pick something that you really like to draw. It's easy for you to draw, and say, okay, well, now I'm gonna this, this particular drawing. I'm gonna do a, the five drawings where all I'm gonna focus on is just getting the anatomy right, and everything else to hell with it. Who cares? Right. If I get the the rocks don't look like real rocks, if the buildings look really goofy, I don't care. All I'm worried about right now is just focusing on drawing this person's anatomy properly, but in a in the context of shipping a fun drawing that is fun for me to draw. Right. Whether it's like, well, animal anatomy. Well, I'm going to draw giraffes. I love giraffes. They're so much fun to look at. Okay. Well, let's focus on giraffe anatomy. Um, make a cool drawing of giraffes driving cars. Whatever. Right. Um, that has been helpful to me because the idea of sitting down and just drilling and doing like, you know, a hundred anatomy drawings is, it seems a lot less, it's harder for me to feel motivated to do it. It's something I know I should do. And it's something that like Ann and I have talked about, like going to like some figure drawing classes and doing, you know, we just bought some Conte crayons, you know, it's like, let's go do some gesture drawing. That'll be fun. Um, but when you're, yeah, like the, the 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 drilling that is necessary in order to do that skill acquisition for me is a lot more fun when I create little mini creative challenges to keep me shipping something and leveling up to the process of shipping that thing. And then having that body of evidence, not just the sketchbook, but maybe some kind of like series of things. Lucy Bellwood did the 100 Demon Dialogues, right? For for like 100 days, she did a drawing of her, her as a cartoon character interacting with a cartoon inner demon. Um creating some kind of themed thing that you just set yourself as your own personal challenge um, gives and, and same with doing a graphic novel, like what I did in 2000 to 2006, you know, gives you, I don't know, there's just such, there's such a good um, feedback mechanism in there to help keep you motivated and checking in on it for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the thing where, I mean, if you're doing this to improve, then asking, I mean, so say, setting up a theme, uh, setting up an interval, what is, what does it mean to complete or ship right so you you set up that criteria and 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 then uh like some kind of the 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 mini goal within your intent what are you what are you doing intentionally with this uh is it is about anatomy anatomy composition color values or design all the above well you kind of cranked up the the difficulty uh, yep. by by doing all of them all at once but if you're ready great um <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> For me, it has to be. I only learn one thing at a time, uh, and and I like to like focus on what's a fun thing to do. Can I add a little bit of difficulty to it to make it extra challenging? And then the the fun is it, the fun is actually like it 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 enhances the flavor of the fun through the act of the creating that friction of the difficulty. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, that that makes sense. So it's it's like a, a workout that you want to do, and that you have some accountability. It's, you know, mm-hmm. with the with the sharing, that makes sense. Um, the the thing, let's see, there's a lot in there, like that we just shared. I think there's mm-hmm. there, it's a little bit of a, a a pile of tools you can use to come up with how do you want to develop yourself. And if I, if I were to put a cap on it, like one of the reasons I was getting at this whole approach is that so much of your portfolio, and this is something you hear a lot from a lot of other art podcasts um, is, and art instructors, is the, the portfolio should be a showcase of like what you love to do. What would you be most like? So like, yeah, you want to make a living drawing and then somebody comes along. They're like, well, I, I have money here for somebody to do all these technical illustrations and cutaways of the interiors of automobiles. Well, that may or may not be your thing. Right. And so like having a body of work that demonstrates what your thing is helps you get you uh, attracts the right people to you that, that so that's the most harmonious and uh, obvious and um, fruitful relationship. I got approached by um, a, 
a art director at Nick Jr. to do uh, character designs for a project because of a series of drawings I was doing just for the pure fun of it to challenge myself on drawing on my Galaxy Note 10.1 years ago, right? So I was just doing some coffee shop drawings of like, ah, you know, it'd be really cute, like little robot girls in like people clothes. And like this art director saw it was like, what you're doing there is really similar to what we're trying to do with this. Could you do some character designs for us, right? So it was it was drawn without agenda except for just like leveling up something that was fun for me to draw. Does that make sense? And that and because I made it something that was fun for me to draw, it showcased where my strengths are and where my interest is to attract the right clients. So and and at no point did the art director say, Your anatomy is superior to everybody else's anatomy in illustration, right? Like that wasn't what they were after. Although that was part, I mean, the, my approach to anatomy was part of it, but in my mastery, however you want to describe that was part of it. But there was another really important part. This goes back to that. I was just listening to this on an art podcast. Is, is craft more important or is emotional connection with audience more important? You know, and like the, the guys in the show were like, yes and yes. <laughs> craft is the vehicle to create emotional connection with the audience I'm like yep that's that is correct you know it's a it's a false dichotomy if you're trying to turn it into a choice but um but let's not forget that that emotional connection happens because of what you express through the work that is important to you so and that's the thing is that if you know even if you don't know all the what all the why and then getting the practice going. And then it becomes a kind of a journal that, that is an accumulation and you can start, start to look for patterns in it and whatnot. I have used the unblocking project for that as well. Uh, and also where unblocking is when I did a drawing and published it for every day for the, for the whole year. And it was, um, and with, with different levels of, of um, fidelity and, 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 and detail and, and different goals I would have to, to do. Sometimes I was practicing a tool or whatever. Uh, but it was all, it was pretty similar to what you described, Jersey, as far as the fun. And the shipping every day was, um, I mean, sometimes it was just pretty raw doodles, like stick figures. But I'll be darned if some of those weren't, didn't get the most comments and likes and all this stuff. And uh, because, because yeah, it's this, uh, yeah, the the ideas that, that I cared about that I thought would be interesting and just, just getting over the hurdle of getting it out there. Um, yeah. And doodling is actually its own art form too. Like, you know, it's compute communicating with simple uh, shapes is, uh, you know, has a value as well. Absolutely. The dot in the line, look, do a search in the YouTube for the dot in the line, a romance in lower mathematics, where it is a love story where literally it's, it's a little dated. It's from the sixties. There's some, there's some, the, but but it's it's literally about a dot and a line and yes. their their relationship. You know what I'm talking about. I know what you're so. talking about in the story and how it's dated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's there's some seriously dated stuff in there. But in terms of just like execution of an idea using very simple tools, I think it's a great uh, example for that. Yes, all and right. it's not dated in the way of and it, but it's it's a it's still it's very cute and all that kind of stuff. It's not dated in funny clothes kind of dated. It's dated in like uh, idea of gender and stuff. Dated. Yes. So. Yeah. There's problematic gender ideas in it, but yes, yeah. but don't look at it for that. Look at it for like what they tell and how little they used to tell it. Um, okay. Uh, are we at a good point where we could take a break and maybe come back with final thought? Yeah, I think we are. Okay. Let's do this. All right. So, uh, we'll be back in, we're going to take a, a quick break minute or two to talk about some other people who make this show possible. And then we're going to conclude with final thought. Uh, but before we get to final thought, we got to thank, like I said, people who make the show possible. Those people are us. We make this show possible. Oh, I went the wrong thing. There's the thing I want. Uh, we we create stuff and then we bring the thoughts that occur to us while we create stuff to the show. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire. Um, the book is called Mining for Trouble. It is a 92-page graphic novel, graphic novella. I don't know what you call it. It's a comic book. It's comics. It's uh, images in deliberate sequence to communicate meaning. And it's about a bear and a bird who are best friends. They go off on adventures together, try to help people fix their problems. And, you know, just like those kind of traveling adventure stories, they encounter problems on the road. And in this story, they encounter these mineral girls who have taken over a mine because 
their species uh, subsists on precious metals instead of the foods we eat. And so they take over the mine because they're, they're hungry. And uh, it causes a battle between Boulder and Fleet and the Mineral Girls. And uh, it's an exploration of what's the proper use of force in these kinds of conflicts. And you can find it at jdros.com slash books or on indieplanet.com. You can order your copy. You can get a digital copy or a physical copy. Uh, yeah. And Rob, you do another thing too besides this. Yeah, well, I do, um, well, creative process coaching for individuals and teams. And uh, uh, my, my partner, Kate, does uh, uh, coaching for uh, like couples with big goals. And uh, so we have this business at uh, shieldstenzinger.com where essentially you can sign up for uh, a, a free discovery session, little, you know, uh, to get us in the, what's it like to be coached by either of us and, uh, explore what you're, what you're thinking through. What do you care about? What are you making next? What keeps you up at night about your projects, that kind of thing. And this is, uh, you know, the, the process of coaching helps you, uh, have a, have like someone else skillfully listen and progress through the problems and whatnot. And, you know, depending on your style, maybe there's a little, maybe there's an accountability feedback to, loop as well but it's all about what works for you and and it's not someone coming in and consulting and doing that thinking for you it's it's this um really deep listening working with you talking with you thinking things through and it's yeah so break through the things that are that are keeping you from getting them what you want to get done so that's uh that's at shieldstenzinger.com sign up for, i think i have the url incorrect on the screen there's two s's in the middle isn't there correct ah Dirty birdie jersey. Okay, so shieldstenzinger.com with two S's. I'm going to put that second S right now on the screen. There we go. Shieldstenzinger.com. And uh, did you say anything about like the enrollment period? Uh, let's see. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the a discovery session is free. Yeah, sign on up. Uh, at shieldstenzinger.com. I linked it in the chat as well. All right, if you're watching this video live on um, YouTube, well, if you're not watching it on YouTube live, if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, giving it a thumbs up helps more people find the show. I don't quite know the rating system on Twitch yet, but I'm sure there is some kind of rating system in order to give the show a, a plus one to let more people find it. Um, There's follows, and okay. then, I don't know, Okay, we we're still learning the new the new territory, but yes, follow us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash lean into art. And uh, if you're listening to the show in a podcatcher, giving us a five star review wherever you listen to us uh, helps more people find the show as well. And then there's also self contained videos that you can download at a price of your choosing at leanintoart.com slash workshops. Okay, break is over, so we got to do final thought now, Rob. What are you thinking in terms of final thought? Oh, well, I mean, you threw out the, the humdinger of uh, how to define Rob's job or how to define Jersey's job, which was an interesting thought experiment, but that could be, I don't know, <laughs> a little bit out of scope. Yeah. But, <laughs> I feel like that could be like an open call. Is yeah. like, that could be something where people can email us in at um, leanatort.com. Um, there's like a keep in touch link where people can email us and like, what if you could define like in as, as specific as possible, yeah, it's ahead. not just like we, we asked, uh, leaners at, at some point, not just like, uh, and, and honestly, some folks provide this just with, with, uh, comments and whatnot, um, in, in, in the iTunes, um, podcasts app and whatnot. Uh, it's like, well, um, what, uh, what, let's see, what brings you here and, as, as far as the, the, the show and, uh, and like, so, and why, and, and what is it about the, the things that um, either of us help out with? Like, how do, how do each of us um, give you, I don't know, make it, make it worth your time for listening to the show? Um, that'd, be, mm. that'd be interesting. And so, I mean, it's, and it's trying to work toward the idea of, well, um, how do we describe better? Like, this is why we do the show and what we believe. And here's, here's the, and, and so that's the show. But then there's also the thing of like, well, we're working on other projects. We have the, we have new endeavors and things going on. And we're always looking for that, that new, insightful, easy way to describe what it is that we do. And uh, yeah, 
what's yeah. so helpful? Not not the what, but like why do what what's the thing about it that is that's that's the the essence of usefulness and um interesting of like, oh yeah, these two are talking to me, or this, you know, Rob talks to me. And I, oh, it clicks because of that. And Jersey yep. talks to me and it clicks because of this. Yep. So something that I always advise young students to do when they're about to go meet somebody that they admire is I say, like, can you think of three things that this person does better than anybody else? Or they do three things that they do that nobody else does. Can you just point out three ways? Of, and it could be such it could be such a tiny thing. It doesn't have to be anything major. Like I once told a voice actor, like your screams, like when you did like this character when they were being like in, they were in pain, your screams were so natural sounding that it was like it it actually felt a little frightening. Like it did not feel like an actor screaming. It felt like this character was really dying, you know. And like they're like, I don't think I've ever heard that before. <laughs> you know, like it, it, it could be a tiny thing, but like if you can identify three unique things that that person does that is the inroad to you know making a real for connection with personally, that personally right yes for you yes. personally for you personally, yeah. for you personally. Yeah. this is the thing i got out of you doing this thing yeah. and it's a way to create a connection between you and this person so you can have a meaningful interaction beyond i love everything you do oh i got my thing signed and i'm going away you know gosh i do that so much and that's where it's like floating on the generic feelings of of oh this is great thank you yeah, I mean, and that's real, that's right? There's, there's, there's nothing, important. there's nothing manufactured about that. As a matter of fact, that feels almost more natural because, like, what you're feeling is so big that it would take a poet to put into language for the, that is appropriate to the moment. So, mm -hmm. a way to manage that, and th this is artificial. I'm coming up with a structure to, to frame some thoughts around so I can express this in a way that is grokkable and understandable by another human being. <laughs> um, so. I'm, I'm not denigrating saying I love everything you do. It's just that I know that whenever I've had that interaction with somebody that I admire, I always walk away going like, eh, I didn't really, I, did it connect? I don't know. I don't know. I, but when I went up to, again, going back in my own history, when I met Dan Mishkin for the first time, I had three things. I'm like, okay, there was this scene in Amethyst Princess of Gemworld, but this thing happened. And as a child, I sat there and I poured over it because it it haunted me. It struck me. And I just posted that picture to Facebook. You know the one I'm talking about when Sardonyx is being devoured by the emissaries of Varn? Um, like, it, I just sat there and I, I was like wrestling with like, I, I'm too afraid to keep looking, but if I don't stop looking, I won't get it, right? I need to know what's happening here. Like, you know, it's like I had this moment where I'm like saying like, you made a thing that emotionally impacted me and here's why, you know? Um, so, and then also I had this wonderful experience where I'm applying to get on this Ohio state registry of teaching artists and I needed three letters of recommendation. So I went back to my old places of employment and said like, Hey, can you help me out? Write a letter of recommendation. And like reading this, uh, I think we should just get these all the time. I think once a year we should get letters of recommendation from people we work with to get like a really clear list of things that we do that are like effective, right? Like I found out like, Oh, that's what I do when I'm teaching. <laughs> <laughs> because you you described it from a third party's point of view, like what it looks like when I teach. I'm like, oh, that gives me such a clear sense of like what my value is, um, at least from your perspective. So uh, think of this as we're asking the leaners for a couple sentences, letter of recommendation. Like what, what do we do that connects with you in a meaningful way? What specific thing have you, have you heard us say or do? What kind of ways have you heard us like engage with a thought the way we, maybe an image we share, um, maybe it's the way we construct our approaches to things, whatever it is. Like when you had that, like, oh, that's it. You know, you know that feeling. What was it? What, what triggered it? I also believe that it's easier to do, to, to do this description for someone else. And mm -hmm. if you can do this for yourself, that is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a superpower, I think. Yeah. Where, uh, because when you do go about an endeavor, you will have essentially instant audience centric language to help transmit and share that, that endeavor. So that is, that's why I think it's pretty powerful. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. Not even going to say asking for a friend, totally selfish and it would be incredibly useful. It would be useful for the show because we would be able, as we're like exploring this new territory of Twitch, like how do we, you know, connect with the people on Twitch who are looking for stuff like this, mm -hmm. right? So, 
All right. All well, right. I think once again we did a podcast, Rob. Um, thanks, thanks for the folks in the chat. Well, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this right. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's uh, Yithimus. Yithimus. Lithimus? Lithimus? Is that an L? Is it L or a capital with, I? Uh, non, like with sans serif fonts in that L, right? Or, or yeah. I. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for hanging out in the chat and interacting with us. Thanks for the folks who download, watch, and listen. Uh, we stream this show live on Thursdays and collect it as a podcast at leanatwart.com and patreon.com slash leanatwart. We'll be back with another episode soon. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanatwart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger on places like Instagram and Twitch. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.